Okay, welcome back at uh, Yakaima TV. Uh, today we have a, a new topic uh, in this in this Yakaima TV series. It's about vertical farming and indoor farming. And our guest is Maarten van der Kruis. He's founder and CTO of Urban Crop Solutions based in Belgium. And he's going to talk about the true return on investment uh, of indoor farming. Uh, so welcome Maarten. Great to be uh, to have you in our uh, studio, and uh, I would love to hear about your company. So you can start with your presentation. Uh, thank you very much, Peter. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I would love to start um, by explaining a bit um, the global agri-food system. As we know it, um, we are facing on this regard many challenges, and here food security and food quality are top of mind with many of our consumers. And traditional agriculture at the same time is battling scarcity of water and arable land. What we have with indoor vertical farming is that we can propose an appealing and timely solution, right? What we're doing is we're growing food indoors under LED light in vertical layers on top of each other and in perfect conditions in terms of temperature, humidity, wind speed, CO2 levels, and so on. This concept is actually also known as controlled environment agriculture. By having these multiple layers and these perfect growing conditions, and we can grow a hundredfold of the crops per square meter of floor surface. And most importantly, perhaps, we only consume 5% of the fresh water compared to traditional agriculture. And that's because we recapture the water which is transpired by the plants and reinsert that in the irrigation system. Now, what we see that, that many people are not really aware of is that if you're, for example, eating a Waldorf salad in New York City, that lettuce used for that salad has traveled for over 3,000 miles for over three days in refrigerated trucks. The traditional supply chain here has an estimated 30% of waste before it gets to a consumer. Instead, by growing food hyper-local, that waste can be saved. The consumer can buy produce with a longer shelf life and will have a 365 days of security of supply and consistent quality. As a company, um, our markets today geographically are in regions where you have limited fresh water, such as the Middle East, where you have limited daylight, such as Sweden or Scandinavia, or where you have limited space, such as Singapore, or very elaborate supply chains. For example, the East Coast, which needs to be foreseen with lettuces from California. And the applications today are mainly concentrated on leafy greens and our clientele are successful businesses for high-end restaurants, uh, farmers markets, and retailers have now started pilot projects. Now, um, in light of recent, um, well, uh, happenings globally, um, COVID-19 is of course a very important topic. And we're actually seeing that this is proving that our supply chain is actually broken. Migrant, migrant workers are not able to reach their growing fields uh, and crops can't close, uh, cross closed borders. So this is driving not only many companies, but also governments to look at indoor vertical farming as part of the solution. And also for us as a company, in the number and quality of leads we're getting in, uh, we are feeling that this market is really at an inflection point today. Now, let me explain a bit more how we work as a company. At Urban Crop, we always start from the plant's biology. And on this slide, you see a picture of our Urban Crop Research Center, where we can control every parameter of plant growth in one of our 10 labs, and ranging from light intensity, temperature, humidity, you name it. And this allows us to actually very rapidly identify the optimal combination of growth parameters to maximize the return on investment of our clients of course, by taking into account what their end product is. This can, for example, be different eh, if you want to grow or sell a head lettuce, or you want to sell a mixed or a bag lettuce. The eh, plant growth recipe, as we call it, so the combination of all these growth parameters will be different. What we're doing with these plant growth recipes is actually we're putting them in a database, and each system that we have operational across the world is linked with that database or our clients can use those recipes in their solutions. And um, across the globe, we have today 28 vertical farms operational, located in three continents, 
Europe, Asia, and North America. And our clientele is delivering to the food service industries, farm markets, and hospitals. Just one, one question. Uh, can you go back? Can you see a difference between the type of clients uh, in, the three, in the three continents? I mean, are they either growing different sort of crops or are they have specific market requests or? Um, yes, there is a very, very high difference. Um, what we see in North America is that we have um, a mixture of um, lettuces mm -hmm. that are being produced and where you have a high demand from the market. Whilst in Europe, for example, it's very difficult to be competitive um, with, a, with a lettuce as we have uh, in the Netherlands, in Belgium, well, we have the, the green heart of lettuce production, let's say. Yeah. Um, in Europe, um, we, let's say in Western Europe, we have more focus on herb production with our clientele. Mm -hmm. Whilst in Nor Northern Europe, competitiveness with lettuce can be achieved as well. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and Asia has there a very um, different, um, well, product offering or market demand than, of course, we have in Europe and in the United States. Okay. Now, based on the know-how that we have on indoor plant biology, we've actually um, designed uh, a first generation vertical farm over the years. Um, in our industry, uh, many players have come in and gone out of the market, but uh, we are still here, or what makes us really unique is actually the, the low labor cost inside the systems. What we have done is we have sensibly automated these indoor farms, by letting the, allowing the crops to come automatically to the operator by the way of two carousels. As you can see on this slide, the top two layers are one carousel and the bottom two layers are another carousel. And young plants are entered on the top and as they grow, they move automatically to the back, are placed one layer lower and are then pushed automatically to the front to the location of the operator. This design allows uh, someone to grow plants with different growing speeds at the same time in one system. However, we've um, received a lot of experience in this industry over the last years. We have received a lot of feedback from our clientele. And this actually has allowed us to design and soon launch a complete new concept, the Module X. This farm offers probably the best ROI in the business. Let me explain. What we have done here is maximized the amount of growing surface with an increase of 25% in each module. Each growing module is linked to a central operations room. And depending on the size of a, or the growth of clients' business, the amount of modules can easily be expanded and automation can be added uh, for seeding, for washing, and so forth. We've also taken phytosanitary measures into account by adding an airlock and the option to include office modules, cold store modules, etc. So this farm concept can be placed anywhere without the need of an expensive building and the solution is purely focused on delivering return on investment for our clientele. Now, to come back, it will come be back. available for order in July. Okay, to come back to your ROI, um, that is one of the major, let's say, issues for, for companies to start with this. Eh? The, 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 I mean, traditionally a farmer knows more or less what, what his ROI is on him uh, when growing, let's say, in the open air. But this is a very important issue. Uh, is that also one of the reasons why uh, well, some, some companies uh, have been also reluctant to invest in this uh, in, in the past? Well, the thing is, uh, indoor farming um, offers, of course, the benefit that you can have higher productivities, but the production costs actually have two main components. Labor, yeah. of course, uh, if if people use forklifts to reach a top layer or something, this is all costly time that is being wasted just for, for movements. That's why we try to automate these things. And secondly, is electricity. Uh, electricity is also high cost and the prices vary all across the globe. Yeah. But by having there the sensible automation, certain solutions, 
And by being able to replace expensive labor with electricity, we can improve this. Okay. And it's by combining those things and by also doing a feasibility on a case by case basis that we can see what is now the best solution for this particular project or this particular client. Yeah, because it's also dependent, uh, uh, I, I suppose, on the type of crop you are growing. Uh, Absolutely true. Yeah. Um, the type of crop and even the type of, of end product that you want to put in the market. Is it, for example, a basil which is used for processing purposes? Or will it be a basil which you want to sell in a clamshell and where only, for example, the top leaves are used? Okay. And you have a way different approach or growth strategy in either scenario. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and then to conclude, Peter, I would like to, um, to share actually a picture of our first generation container farm located um, at IKEA in the city of Malmö, Sweden. What they're doing here is they're growing lettuce inside the container farm and deliver it from the parking lot to their in-store restaurant, only 100 meters away. While in fact, what we were doing before, in winters, they were flying in their lettuces from Spain over 2,000 miles away. And with this image, we can clearly see the positive impact our technology is able to offer. Yeah? Reducing these supply chains, reducing this transport and the emissions. And here also, it has even been linked with renewable energy sources to really have also a positive LCA in general. Okay. Well, that's an interesting, interesting uh, application. Uh, now, you show IKEA here. Uh, if you look at, let's say, the, 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 in general, your customers, what type of customers are these? I mean, it's probably not a traditional farmer, I guess. Well, some of them are traditional farmers or have traditional farms and um, inserted this technology as a way of diversification or uh, to, to grow plants which are not being able to grow in the, let's say, um, local climate. Mm -hmm. Others are um, food distributors who are delivering directly to restaurants. And of course, some are just, uh, well, uh, uh, entrepreneurs uh, who want to start their business and have, have an impact locally by supplying them to end consumers or businesses in their area. Um, slowly, we're seeing um, a shift to more and more larger and corporate um, clients entering, like retailers, uh, parties like IKEA, because they're seeing the added value of this technology. A, uh, so it means it's, it can be uh, an inter an, um, a disruptive, also it's a disruptive technology, uh, I assume, because you can change your value chain and you can change your, your, your business models, I guess. You're absolutely right. And new business models are rising today because of this technology, mm -hmm. where you have kind of farming as a service concepts that are being initiated all across the world. Okay. okay. Well, that is a very interesting Thank you very much, let's say, in, to give a, a good overview in, in such a short uh, time. It's very clear where this market can go to. Um, as always, I end uh, a session like this with a question about the, the, the person behind the presenter. We always watch your favorite music or your art or your book or your city or your food, whatever. So I'm curious to know from you what's, what, in this case, what's, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, what I, what I maybe would like um, to share here is um, a book I um, read not so long ago. I received it from a friend yeah. who actually, um, well, it, it had a positive impact on me. And I think it, it's an interesting read for everyone. And the book was called The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari. It's, it's written by um, Robin Sharma. Yeah. And basically... The conclusion you can make by reading the book is um, um, the way we have been uh, um, raised in our society, the way what we're seeing on, on, on social media, on television, is that we think that, that success and happiness are always linked with material gains. That needs to be shown uh, whether you're successful or not. And the book actually re makes you realize, but also reflect on the fact that happiness and success are found in very different aspects than this. And it is little to do actually with, with, with money or materialism. 
And whilst reading that, it also made me think of, well, um, the moment when I initiated um, um, Urban Crop Solutions and we started this company, um, the impact we want to have with this technology on not only the environment, but also on society. And, well, I can only recommend it to everyone to read. Okay, so that's the, the monk who sold his Ferrari. Yes. Okay, we going to, I'm going to look uh, to, find, to find this title and maybe read it as well. So, well, I would like to thank you very much for your presentation and uh, all the best with your, the, the, the launch of your new uh, uh, factory. And uh, well, we keep in touch and hope to talk to you soon. Thank you very much. My pleasure, Peter. Talk soon. Bye.